All right, hi, I'm Val Snow and I'm from a polygamous group. Uh, I'm the first son of the seventh wife. My dad had 14 wives and in that culture, they believe, um, sorry, <laughs> trying to remember. They, they have three things that they push, uh, polygamy, um, follow the law of one above another and consecration and consecration is where you give everything, your money, your time, all that you are to building God's work here on this earth. So that's kind of the, the breakdown of that cult. It, what, what would their ultimate goal be though? Like where, you know, are they trying to per like, create a certain type of a world or are they trying to get rid of something or are you asking me when i'm there or are, are you asking me now <laughs> oh no the, yeah like <laughs> the um the order or uh, what they the believe in group okay so i'm gonna give you kind of two answers just because i don't know how to separate the two because like mm -hmm. in the order everyone there is a drone you believe and sorry I, they call themselves the order i don't know if i explained that but everyone has the same belief system. So to answer your question, like what the ultimate goal is, well, um, the ultimate goal is to do what God wants. And that order is the only place that you can live all of God's laws uh, is what they teach. Um, now, if you're asking me what they're all about, it's about money, control, and sex. Mm. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. So um, now that you're out, you see what it what it really is and and have completely changed your mind <laughs> oh like now that i'm out it's like none of that's even real guys what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> you can now describe it like you just did <laughs> yeah and yeah. was there i guess was there uh like one moment when you realized like this this is all crazy. I need to get out. Or was it like a buildup over time? You just had questions that weren't getting answered. And, and finally it was too much. I remember the straw that broke the camel back and I can kind of go into that. Yeah, um, please. Yeah. So my sister Chanel, she was on escaping polygamy and she was with a guy within the group and she was being beat by him. And he was like, not even following. They have like very strict standards in the order. And he was like going to strip clubs, drinking, and all this is like extreme for order. It's like breaking all the order standards, right? So he he started beating her, and um, we so Chanel called out for help, and we got our uncles, our outside uncles, to bring her back to my mom's house, and we were kind of hiding her from her husband and mm -hmm. the, my dad and other leaders said that she needed to go back to him or she needed to leave the order. And that really started making me question. But like what really like just opened my eyes was the guy's dad. So I, I was working as the lunch lady. I say the lunch lady because they used to tease me and call me the lunch lady. Oh. But now I just own it. Like that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I fed 700 kids by the time I was leaving. Wow. Wait, is that at school and, or in a compound? Yeah, or? elementary school. Okay. Every day? They, yeah, every day. Every wow. school day. So wow. I was their lunch lady and that, we did snacks. And all the teacher aides that came in to get the snack were like 14 years old. And they really heavily push these women to find their number one choice. Basically, they heavily push them to get married at that age or to start looking to who they're supposed to marry at 14. So at f well, at 12 is when they, um, oh, put them on man. a dance card and I'll go into that a little bit. Okay. later. Wow. But, so yeah, young. So, but basically I'm trying to watch out for these girls and be like, don't marry this guy. He beats his wives. Like he beat mm. my sister. Mm. And a lot of them are so brainwashed. They're like, well, if God wants me to marry him, I will. And I was like, well, God doesn't want you to be beat. So how do they know when God That's wants a good answer. to do that? Like, Sorry, what, what was your question? Like, how do they know when God wants them to do that? What, what tells them that it's a message or a decision from God? Like, how do they 
feel like they know that. So I have a, a YouTube video that kind of explains it. I have a gay brother that married in the cult, had seven kids and left, and I can send you that link. But I also can yeah. um, briefly answer that. Um, they, they have this thing called direction. And direction is basically it's inspiration from God. It can be a dream. It can be your dad had a dream. It could be your mom had a dream. They use oh. dreams a lot. People dream it for you. Yeah, so like um, the leader can come to you and have a dream, and just like it needs, if there's a dream that needs to be dreamt, they'll dream it. Man. Okay, Ooh. so arranged marriage, more or less. Ish. Yeah. So back to that. Um, talking to these fourteen year olds, I'm like, just here's your PBs and Js. I don't need to like, don't marry this person. Like, <laughs> eventually, it gets back to. Um, the that guy's mom because she's also she's one of the teachers and so one of the teacher aides mm. um tell tell her what i'm saying and then it gets back to the dad and the dad calls me and he's just like this is this is the call that like brace basically was like everything's a lie like i was questioning before but mm. like this is it like this is <laughs> everything's a lie and it happens to be i don't know if you know amanda ray she has a youtube channel i think but... i saw an interview with her did she do yeah. one with police? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I saw, I, I would say maybe one of them. Yeah. So it was about... actually her dad because her brother was married to my sister. Oh. And so he calls, he calls me, which is kind of weird for a number, like a higher number man to call just me. I'm just a peon lunch lady. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, so he's calling me. He's like, I heard you're telling people I'm beating my wives. And I was like, no, I said that your son beats his wives. I don't know what you do with yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming he, he learned just, it somewhere. <laughs> I don't I don't know. I really don't know. I couldn't tell you. But I was like, he, he was like, well, that's not what I heard. I heard that you're saying I beat my wives. And then I was just like, from who? <laughs> like I'm very like outspoken. I don't yeah. know where I got the balls there. <laughs> but anyways, I was like, um, from who? And then she he tells me this lady. So I hang up. I literally hang up the phone to call this lady to find out. And she's just like, uh, no, I never talked to him. And then I was like, I try to call him back. But then there's all it's like a hoop. They have like secretaries to get to these numbers, man. You go, sometimes even the, in the buildings that they work at. You have to have like a key fob to get in the building to oh. like even talk to them, whatever. Anyways, so mm -hmm. I'm like, I I have I get like a message I can leave him, and I'm just like, tell him, um, that he never talked to that so and so. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was kind of confronting him, and then I hung up and was just like, right when I hung up is when I made a dating profile to date men. Oh. Oh. I can't wow. believe you're allowed to do that. Uh, I, I don't think I was allowed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would say I we definitely point, were not. No. You can even no, at that point, no internet or anything. Yeah. So uh, that was okay. it. I was done. <laughs> when you say numbered men, is that like an yeah, elder they, or something? So a numbered man is someone that has the priesthood. And the priesthood... They don't give it to just anyone. They actually made fun of the Mormon church for this part because the Mormon church gives it to a boy when he's like 12 or something. And I could be getting this wrong because I'm not Mormon. And when I left religion, I left all organized religion. Yes. <laughs> but, um, basically, a numbered man has the priesthood, which means that he has the power of God. So if he gives you a blessing, he, he has the ability to bless you or curse oh. you. Oh, Interesting. So, hmm. so yeah, you want to be friends with those guys. It, is it like a rank system? Like you said, the higher number, like the more God they have in them or something like that? So yeah, actually the low, lower the number, the higher they are in the church. And the oh. lowest current number is number nine. And that's the leader brother Paul is what they, his, they call him. Okay. So, yeah. It, how come it's not like one or something like that? Well, because once you have a number, Eldon was the founder of the polygamous cult, uh -huh. and he did it back during the Depression. Uh -huh. But um, 
and that's how the co-op came about and that's how the consecration kind of got out of hand well mm-hmm. started and then eventually got out of hand okay but um but yeah he was number one and once you get a number no one can get that number again they'll put it, it on your tombstone when you die it'll have your like you can look up dead mem- members that were numbered men and they have their numbers next to their name okay wow right. okay so and if, nine. if you're numbered is that when you can marry multiple women well you or can you're, you have to be able to you have to marry multiple women to go to the highest degree in god's kingdom so it's uh, it's kind of a requirement to get to heaven oh <laughs> how did they it's what it's was the reasoning so for that is there was there ever an explanation of why that was necessary that you had to have multiple wives or it's just like that's what god said and you have to do that it? was one of joseph smith's original teachings like oh. um in the for the lds church and they're gonna i'm gonna get backlash for that in the comments i'm sure but like no um they joseph smith had multiple wives he basically got caught boinking a girl in the a barn and she was 14 and her name was oh frick now i can't remember but, <laughs> but yeah you you'll figure this out you can google it all okay, but, um, okay. <laughs> yeah she um yeah. And then all of a sudden he like makes up a story like oh it's one of i was commanded to by an angel <laughs> but yeah so it was something that joseph smith was doing and once the lds church stopped and they stopped when brigham young i can't remember the whole like details of this but basically for utah to become a state they had to stop living polygamy openly mm-hmm. and they oh. still did for a little while secretly but when they stopped completely that's when all these other subgroups started, like the FLDS, mm. the Kingstons, the um, AUB, and all these other polygamous groups. They started forming because they felt that the LDS church had lost their way. Oh, okay. Because if it was God's law, it wouldn't change. Mm. You know, I was when I was listening to your interview on cults of consciousness, and I was talking about uh, you. You were you were talking about um like how many wives and how many children they have and that it's not like you you see the donor if you will all that often but he knows the cycle so he knows when to be there to impregnate the women almost like it just reminded me that story the handmaid's tale it's Mm. almost like that so similar to the handmaid's tale Mm. It's so weird. Like I cannot like that movie or sorry, that TV show was originally a, a book, but it, they made a movie, I think in the eighties when I was a really young kid, I was trying to watch this video of it and I couldn't even at a young age, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it, <laughs> but it must be hard to actually live that type of a life where that's what you are used for you know that's what you're quote unquote good for or you're used for it's almost a weird entrapment or something yeah um, i think what's weird is you for the women it's worse so mm-hmm. i've never I, every woman i've ever talked to that has left the cult at some point has thought about just like being being done mm. yeah they don't want to carry on anymore but um and I guess that's not normal for people in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not. that's wild. <laughs> uh, so are they, when they're young and they're just getting into their, you know, first marriages, are they like excited about it? And then they realize what it really is afterwards, or do they kind of know beforehand, like looking at their moms, um, you know, do they see how rough it is on the women and they're, little so i think it what's weird is it's normal everything there is normal even when you do see the rough side of things you don't know anything different because you're so sheltered from the outside world Mm. that and you're um yeah that you just even if you just do what god wants that's like the number one goal Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah interesting but someone's going to tell you what God wants because maybe you didn't have a dream. I don't know. 
it's it's funny how both of you just hearing you talk now you realize how ridiculous some of this stuff was yeah yeah and, i know like I'll, I'll bring up things and people are just like and to me, <laughs> all i knew growing normal. up you know? yeah well jenny i want to hear like what is so i don't even know what scientology is so kind of break that down a little bit so it started in 1950 it was supposed to be um their big famous book is Dianetics. So the idea was that it was a science of mental health. It um, Actual mental health professionals rejected it as like not a good theory. Um, but, uh, and I actually think my personal opinion is this is why um, L. Ron Herbert, he's the founder, they call him. Um, he changed what he was called throughout time, but at the time founder, and he has this huge, like aversion to psychology, uh, psychiatry, psychotherapy, anything to do with mental health. He's very, 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 very opposed to it. it says it's like literally the cause of all the downfall of every human in this planet and other planets, actually it gets a bit science fiction -y and weird, but <laughs> Um, I think part of why it really took off because it did that whole Dianetics thing really blew up. It was during, it was like, um, you know, you had the world war two, but before the Vietnam thing happened. And so you had just that state of, I think people needing help and here was something new that was a bit odd, a bit different. And so I think it kind of blew up. And then I, um, I know he had some troubles with the copyrights and he had financial troubles and whatever. And I think his solution was, well, let's turn this into a church and let's be religious because, um, well, it depends on who you're listening to. If you're outside, you hear that he did it for monetary reasons to get rich, make money and be protected because if you can get that exemption from the IRS, you can't really get attacked. But if you're within, like I am, he'll tell you that um, Dianetics wasn't enough because it's dealing with the mind and how um, uh, basically the idea is that you have these um, like engrams, they call them. So there are moments of pain or unconsciousness or whatever. And they, uh, they say that all of your like aberrative behavior um, stems from these things that were said during that time of pain. So like if I, if I broke my arm and someone said, uh, yelled while I was in pain, yelled, you're crazy, something, something, I might later on become a little bit crazy or go do something crazy. And they'll attribute that to the words moment. Yeah. And so oh, wow. in, when you're in there, they say that like through this research, and the, the procedures, they call it auditing, which is just whatever. Anyways, it's weird, but it kind of is because um, if you think of like an audit, you're, you're, um, you're looking into the details and the, you're analyzing things, right? And that's the idea that you're doing with yourself and your mind that it basically went uh, to a spiritual level and that there were other lives that you've lived. And well, that's so kind that's of scary because that seems like a slippery slope because we could all question our every yes. moment and, and then they, what they're going to weasel into that yes be like oh this is the right answer yeah what? so now we're talking spiritual so now it's okay <laughs> in a religion well and it, a spiritual aspect and it's the other lives and stuff so it's something you know maybe yourself in a past life did that's causing yeah. you trouble so it's even deeper you, you might not have done anything but they can explain it by saying oh that was a past life and we gotta get rid of these evil spirits right In yeah your so like for example um they say that you are the cause of everything that happens to you so let's say oh, yeah. a, person, a child I'll is essay, right mm -hmm. they they will say that the child did something to make they that happen that. to them and if they weren't actively doing something this go around, like being a little hoe, then it was probably in a previous life where they maybe are somebody. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, I know too well what you mean, because we had a similar 
similar thing. Like if something happens, but they always spend it in their benefit. Mm. Like, so if something happens, it's your fault. Yes. Like, but then even if like the, one of their numbered men go to jail, like when David went to jail, it's also our my fault for not being good enough. So mm. it was always like your every bad thing was your fault. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't have been there. Maybe you should have handled the situation better. Maybe you should have ate your dinner. <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's hard because it you get the accumulation of that through your life. And it's hard to not feel like you're just this horrible person. Mm -hmm. By the time I was 12, I just accepted I was a bad kid. I was bad. I just sucked. And no matter what I did, I was going to, you know, get, I would just go admit to everything and anything. Like, you know, it's just easier to get it over with, you know, just say I did something wrong. Or even if I didn't, you know, just to end the conversation, I'll just say I did it. But, you know, I, you know, you can ask my parents. They both thought I was a bad kid. I mean. Oh, wow. Are they, I guess they were Scientologists or are. Yeah. And they unfortunately got in really young. So my mom was 21 when she had me, but she was already working for Scientology and then my dad actually, so he's, uh, I'm actually adopted into the, to the family here. <laughs> um, but so he ends up getting involved in it too, becomes my mom's roommate. And then, um, and they started a relationship and stuff like that. And then when I was three, um, they decided to go and join like the highest level of Scientology. It's called the C organization. And that's where they sign, you sign like to be a member, you sign a billion year contract. And, um, Oh, I've heard of the billion year contract of like, yeah. But anyways, how, yeah, explain they, what that they, even is. They're very deadly serious about that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when I signed it, I thought they were joking. I thought it was like, you know, like a kid says, Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to love you for a billion years, you know? So <laughs> I thought the contract was something kind of, cute like that you know like you're gonna be here for a billion years and i was like oh, okay and i think i kind of laughed and the the guy who was room was like this is not funny it's like oh okay um sorry like and i said but is it really a billion years and then how do you figure that and he was like well there's more than one life right i was like i don't know and i mean so they fully believe that after you die, this go around, you have this contract. So you're going to be granted a 21 year leave of absence to go get a new body, grow it up and come back. Okay. I want to ask, I, I want to like dive into that a little <laughs> okay. bit. Cause you like, do. <laughs> do you think that this is how they manipulate you? Because, because you have a billion years to sir, do their bullshit. <laughs> then you're gonna just like this life isn't that big a deal to do all the bullshit they tell you to do yeah so, so, so if they this do... life sucks it doesn't matter because you have another almost billion years to live a better life i guess yeah to and they a better one a lot of yes, things yes. In perspective with that billion year thing Ugh. so like for example you give up so many freedoms and i'll i can get into that more with you if you want but like when you're in there i mean you're working 110, 120, 130 hours a week, you get an allowance on a good week of 50 bucks. Like if you actually get paid that week, you get $50. Wow. And so you don't get time off. You don't get days off. You don't, you don't get all of that stuff. And so you maybe see in the outside world, people have nice clothes or they got a car or they got whatever you don't have. And they just say, look, it's just a small sacrifice. It's just, it's, you're going to sacrifice for this one lifetime. We're going to make it better. So it won't be as bad next time around. Yeah. We had and that same so, thing. Cause when you get married or when you it's for time and all eternity. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you, they always tell you to sin, to like partake of flesh or whatever, like say you want to go have sex outside of marriage, then um, this life is like a sliver of eternity and you're going to be damned for all eternity because you decided to act and do that one thing yeah it's like oh my is gosh. there is there no forgiveness like if you mess up you're done for eternity 
Well, forgiveness, it's like the, the way they explained forgiveness to us was that you have like this two by four. Okay, let's put a nail in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you you get forgiven and you take the nail out, but the hole's mm -hmm. still there. Okay. That's how they explained it. And also back to the what she was kind of saying is like everything that happens to you, basically you deserve it. Mm. So it's kind of like it's kind of builds onto that. So it's so that's like a hole in your soul or whatever, and, and that can't be filled. Like you're done once that's there. And so we can't decide that we're not God, oh. but we are gonna have mm. our trials, and it's like we're gonna have to really. They're gonna you're gonna they're gonna use that shame and guilt to get you to do whatever the hell mm -hmm. they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have some we have that too. Um, like you do your we have different types of confessionals. So one is like where you, um, you, you have to handwrite um, all of the things that you've done that are bad or that you've withheld that were bad. And you have to do it in an exact form. It's like a time, either a time it happened, the exact place that it happened, the exact form that it occurred in and the exact event of the situation kind of thing. And um, they call them OW write-ups. So you do that, or you can get um, like a, they call it security checking. So you're on a device that maybe functions a little like a faulty lie detector, maybe, I guess. I don't know how it works because you can totally fool it, which I did many times. And then there's times where it picks up on something and I just have no way to explain how it's doing that. And so they will interrogate you while you're on there um, and dig around into your life and really try to get all your dirt. Um, and then they have the version that's part of their actual process to spiritual freedom where you do a big, huge confessional. And that's the only one where at the end of it, they, they say that you're forgiven for what you've done, but you have to kind of get to that level and that procedure to, get that forgiveness. Everything else that you do, like these other um, um, interrogations and OW write-ups or whatever, um, they just expect you to feel good for unburdening yourself with it. And you have usually whatever you put in there, they make you go make good on it. You know, they have all their ethics and justice procedures and they make you do that and you get subjected to that and it's not fun. But did you ever put stuff in there that wasn't true? Just so that, um, that like, you get them off your back? Not on the written one so much, but when you're in the interrogation on the meter, if it's just not going the way you want out of there, you're sometimes you'll just say whatever you have to say. And see, they don't give up until they have what they call the general Sherman tank. So it's gotta be the big thing. It can't be as he literally says, uh, stealing paper clips. We don't want to hear about that. We want the real meaty stuff. So if you don't have some of that, since you do this all the time anyways, you know, it's just sometimes you'll just make something up and throw it out there. And that's what when I'm you saying. Said you pull it too, because you can tell when they feel good about it. So you're like, oh yeah. So you can kind of make this meter look like, you know, you're having some kind of, relief or whatever and they'll let you out of there they, you yeah, they go for a certain um movement they have like a this device has like a needle and it has to have a certain movement and then that tells them that you're all cleaned up and happy. which i know is not true. one time i was trying my eyeballs out and they still said oh okay good we're all done you know and i was like i feel the worst i've ever felt in my entire life <laughs> okay and you said they actually suggested things that weren't true and that's yeah, I wanted how they got you to admit the big things because you just wanted out of there. And it also was hours and hours, right? Yeah. They call it the murder routine. Oh my gosh. So what they do is if you're not, you're not, um, you're not getting off the meaty stuff, you know, <laughs> mm. they'll try to go extreme because they think that's a mental mind trick where if you go really extreme, then getting off the thing that you're holding on to is not as bad as that. So it's easier to say it. So like, for example, I go, um, I'm centered. I don't want to tell them that I um, took 50 bucks from the cash box or something, you know, cause that's a, that's, 
you do anything financial in there and that's like, I mean, it's all about money. Yep. <laughs> I don't want to tell someone I did like, let's just, this is just an example. Cause I never stole money, but um, let's say, I, and I don't want to tell anyone. So they'll go, you know, so, you know, well, what kind of things could it, what kind of things could have been? I mean, did you go and um, did you go and murder your friend, you know, in the backyard of that house? And that's so extreme. You're like, of course I didn't do that. I only took 50 bucks. <laughs> so they think, they think that that will, but for me, I'm just wow. like, mm, not going there. But they did one time, I think one of my absolute worst ones was, um, I, I don't know what they were trying to get from me. So I was just agitated. And I think that's what they were picking up on with this device. And because I wasn't getting anything that they wanted to hear, they actually asked me if I had um, essayed my sister, my little sister. Oh, wow. I, I was a big protector of her and my brother. Um, and I was actually there, one of the main caretakers because my mother was never around and my dad was working like pretty much full, full, full time trying to support us. Um, because when he got out of the organization, it's kind of story for another time, but when he had got out of the organization, he had nothing with no experience. So he had to kind of start low and he's trying to support three kids with minimum wage, you know, I wasn't working out real well. So he was working weekends, nights, whatever. And so I'm, I was there, you know, take them to school, pick them up from school, make them do their homework, take them to weekend activities, whatever. But that, so anyways, in this interview, they uh, they, I guess, asked me if I'd done that. And I was like, absolutely not. Like, that's disgusting. Ew. And whatever happened with their little device, they got convinced that I had done that. Oh, my and gosh. I was, that was one I was not going to go and just admit to to get out because I'm, I'm just so, so incredibly opposed to that because I've seen – that occurs so many times where people get blamed for it. Like even little children, my, my friends, when we were like six and seven, just horrible, horrible things. And so I was like, Oh no, I'm not absolutely not going there. I was, they had me locked in that room for nine hours. Oh, I finally got God. so angry. I stood up with their little cans and I hurled them at the wall. And I said, basically get me the F out of here. And if you don't, and then the person stood up in front of the door, like, okay, let's just, let's just clean this up and we'll be done. I was like, if you don't get the F out of my way right now, I will break my way out of here. I said, trust me, I will find anything. I will tear down a wall. I will bust a window. I'm getting out. And so they actually moved aside and let me out. And um, later on, I guess they came back and said, look, it was, they called it, they call it a false read. So it reads on, you know, <laughs> anyway, just a bunch of, crappy stuff. I know. I'm like, I'm still brutal. fascinated by this machine. Like, yeah. is this just freaking a toy they made up? It doesn't really do anything. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they've ever had it. I mean, at least I don't, I know of, I don't know that anyone has really scientifically broken it down and looked at its functioning and <laughs> I don't, it's. You mean there's no weird. research behind it? I'm very surprised. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, it's, it's yeah, but that's one of the things they. That's one of their, I think, key key tools on how they kind of keep people in this thing because people believe that whatever's happening with this device, only this device can really tell like your past life stuff. It can only, you know, it's it's your guide to this this ultimate goal of total spiritual freedom like this the idea is that you are um like the end goal if you will is that um you you are able to be a cause over your whole life all aspects of it but also that you as a spiritual being can go in and out of your body at will without any problems um so that would be on a personal level and then for us workers who get stuck in there. Um, we uh, are after this goal of doing what they call clearing the planet, which is getting everyone to a certain level on the bridge to freedom where they don't have that reactive mind. Like I told you, start with Dianetics and you have all these engrams. 
you get rid of, at some point you can get rid of all of these things. And so the idea is that if you can get enough people on the planet to that point, the planet becomes a much better place. Like well, I think my view from what you told me, what it's actually for is to get you to look at yourself, to pay attention to yourself and to use guilt and shame and just you're always looking inward and you're never pointing out what they're doing because mm -hmm. they're probably like doing some shit and you're just getting distracted because you're so concerned about what you did yeah well, yeah you know you can't, you can't criticize them um that's that's a big big no no you that's not acceptable in any way um yeah. even if you find legitimate flaws or like contradictory facts within the policies any of that even it's just unacceptable it's explained away and you there's no room for criticism they say that if you like criticize it then you have um like uh they call them evil purposes or you have overt you know sins you know against the organization if you and if you're critical they say that criticism comes from having done bad things to it mm. Yeah, they kind of tell us this in the cult I'm from, they say uh, not to find fault with the one above. Um, and it it's like that's their ultimate defense. They don't really go into mm -hmm. detail, but you get your ass beat if you keep, keep going. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Do they do a lot of beatings in there? Like, is that pretty common? Yeah, I would think pretty much. Yeah. And they don't get in trouble with the law or anything? Or are they also kind of the same thing where they got their religious exemption? And so they can hide so, behind. Well, what we're taught like at a very young age to be very afraid of like authorities, like outsiders. Yes. So we won't, we won't talk to mm. a cop. Like if, if, and we're already like, they taught <coughs> us what to say. If, if a cop question us, then we are supposed to tell him like, I have a fake dad, like that Stephen Snow is my dad. And um, I never tell him that, John Daniel Kingston is. I never mm. say that because uh, that's not that's not being loyal to the order. And to be loyal to the order, they basically tell us what to say. And there's so many lies. In fact, I got sick of the lies. Like I just couldn't even. But when I was leaving, but yeah, you. It, but they always say it's okay to lie to outsiders because <laughs> they're it's trying to hurt you. <laughs> they're trying to hurt God's kingdom. Yeah, actually, that's funny. I wonder because, like, sometimes I like I, I listen to you know, obviously, I listen to a lot of these podcasts because they always say women get into like true crime stuff. Like, I'm super down the cult rabbit hole. Like, that <laughs> fascinates me. And I've and I want to say that some of the like stuff with the Mormons um, rang really like because it's been around. Like Mormonism, obviously, you're a branch off of that like it originally had it as its base and i think the jehovah's witnesses also like they have their own thing but they've both been around you know since what the 1800s or something right and okay. so this it, scientology and dianetics come around in like the 50s 60s so i sometimes think that he took some of this stuff from them because they're very high controlled. And so with that, very, very high controlled, but well, he, Joseph Smith his, was a, a Freemason. So mm -hmm. you may, it makes you wonder if their the Scientology founder was also Freemason. And if they like, like came with up with all this stuff together mm -hmm. or at least stole from each other. Yeah. Like, I, they saw I what worked stole from them because they've been around longer, <clears throat> but um, I don't recall ever reading anything about where Elrond Hubbard talks about being Freemason, but you know how there's a lot of conspiracies that surround that surround that organization, um, and Scientologists are very into that conspiracy thing, and you know the Freemasons and the 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 all seeing eye and the um, dollar bill thing, and um, yeah, they get they get like like hyper into that stuff. Hmm. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know why, but yeah, like we were actually told like there would be a, like um, 30 years before the planet would like earth would destroy itself. And that the only way it's managed to survive past that date or what, or it's slowing down is because of the work we've done. 
the higher level ones where they can leave their bodies or whatever. Yeah, like the further you get people up to reaching that level, they like to call it, um, <laughs> it's just so weird. I think that's one other thing too, is like having its own their language. Own, yeah, their own you vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so it so, uh, it's another way to separate you from the rest of the world, but they like to call it theta, where it's putting out like, like probably like the equivalent of good vibes and like doing good and like making pure people more spiritually aware and the idea oh, well, that the more they do that the less likely earth is going to destroy itself at least your self-righteous cunts of the group can be like saving <laughs> the world <laughs> i'm sorry we can edit that out <laughs> no that, that's staying that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> To, to your point, Val, um, money is very involved in Scientology, and they're even more um, upfront about it. Every level you need to get to, Jenny, you can explain this more, but it is a lot of money. So maybe Jenny explained a little bit about that to show him how similar they are in as far as the, the money. money aspect. Yeah. Yeah, because I think you have a funnier like um, thing on the control of personal money where we don't get personal money but the way Scientology makes its money is that the members have to pay for each step of the way so your your lower level stuff is not real expensive it's real kind of introductory kind of 50 bucks or whatever but a lot of that is um I think that's how they grab people because a lot of it is common sense things like you'll find them anywhere like for example their little booklet, The Way to Happiness, has a couple of precepts that, I mean, they come straight out of the Bible, you know, do unto others as you would want them to do you, you know, that that whole thing, you know, from Matthews. Um, and um, there's also, um, but I found a couple of other little things in there that I've actually, just since being out, seen as part of other philosophies and stuff. So, but they're like, golden rule type stuff, if you will, you know, or like helping people fix communication, but, and those are the hooks, you know, so you, you get kind of a start with that, but then you end up chasing this idea of first getting rid of your whole, all the engrams, you know, so that you can, you know, not be crazy and not have negative emotions and blah. And then once you reach that and you realize you still have problems, then you go, well, it must be the next level. It must be the next level. It must be. And then you're so invested financially that you just keep going because you may as well now get to that end and see if you don't really achieve it. But by then you're about probably every bit of a half a million to a million dollars in. Um, well, I, to, I have a question on that part. So mm -hmm. as you're building into it, by the, okay, yeah, 50 bucks starts with starts out with like 50 bucks, right? And then it builds into like to where you're giving everything. You've got like a million dollars into it. And they're like, so my question is, but at that point, isn't your whole life wrapped up into these workshops? Like every be part of your being is part of this. Or yeah, because the more you're the more you're moving kind of there, the more they want you to attend. Like you have different levels of I probably should clarify that. So you have different levels of Scientology. So you have the general people who would be like the equivalent of like a church parishioner. So they, they come, they attend the service, they do the course, they receive some counseling, whatever. They go home, live their normal life. Um, and then you have the people who work on staff, which is uh, like a nine to six or a six to 10 and weekends. Like they have it kind of split up. So you do shorter hours and you also sign contracts for uh, two and a half years or five years. But then again, also you're still living in your normal home. A lot of them have other jobs because Scientology can't pay them, you know, so they're same thing, more or less working for free unless they can get five bucks or a hundred bucks on some great week. Um, so th it's a hard life for them too, because they have to balance normal life stuff, bills, kids, you know, another job often, where are they going to stay, you know, making no money, blah, blah, blah. So they have that struggle and that's what 
they do. And then you have the C organization, which is where my parents join. And eventually I get bring, I get brought into. Um, and that's where you're fully committed. A hundred percent. You live basically on their property. It, 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 it's not exactly a compound in that it's not like fenced off or something, but it is that same concept. They're buildings that are owned by them. You're fed there at that location. You're given uniforms to wear. Um, like you, you're committed 24 seven, like you're, so you're if, huh? when you get to that point where they're, you're in their living condition or like their housing, what happens if you walk and you decide you don't want to do it anymore at that moment? What does that so look like? So if you leave without permission, they call it a blow, which would be like the same as military AWOL, you know, so you're, okay. you're gone without permission. And, um, they will do whatever they have to do to try and find you and bring you back um, and talk you into staying um, or well, use you don't your want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you basically do. You want to stay at that point because you've already given everything, right? Um, yeah, no. I mean, it, it, they make it so hard to get out that a lot of people don't even want to go through the process. It's really grueling. You have to do very heavy manual labor. A lot of times it's disgusting type work. Um, and you get interrogated and interrogated and interrogated until you either break and stay or you finally get through and get out. And that's the only way, if you go through that process, that's the only way that then you can maintain like communication with your family and your friends and anyone oh, else who's like it. If you leave without the permission, and you just take off, you get, they call yeah. it getting declared. It's like being excommunicated. So, you know, or disfellowshipped or whatever, like the Jehovah's Witnesses have you in, but you can no longer talk, talk to them. So like, I don't know if that happened to you when you got kicked out or when you left, are you still allowed to talk to your family and your friends that are in? Oh, so no, you absolutely, absolutely not. Like, so you you have basically, that when you leave, it it would be better if you was never born. Mm. Like, you're worse than going to hell. They actually, for, there's a special place for people that leave God's kingdom, and they don't get to go to hell because hell's too good for them. Wow. They get to go to outer darkness where they don't exist. But if you ask me, that sounds nice. It sounds better than hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I kind of. Right. A part that's a lot of what holds people in though, because they don't they they don't want to lose connection with their their parents or their brothers and sisters or um their friends, like people they maybe have known their whole life, or maybe their boss is a Scientologist, because any once you do that and you get this declare, that's it, you're done. I'm like no more. And Val, are yeah. you taught that from a young age that if you leave you're done to everybody, like this is it, you're your worst so the way they hell. explain it in our group, um, okay, so like say the whole family's a body, like if, but they basically if if say you're this pinky and you mm -hmm. left the family, and they it's they view it as you have gangrene and you need to cut this because if you don't cut this out, it's gonna rot the rest of the body and mm -hmm. everyone's gonna like, you know, go to hell. So just cut them out. So yeah. So like that's another similarity, the money, the cutting people off. And I know in Scientology, Jenny's told me and I've heard other stories about how um, when she was explaining the audits, they're basically writing everything down and recording it. So everything, oh, yeah. all this bad crap you're admitting to, they're keeping a log. So when you um, are declared, they will then publish websites, go to your neighbors, post signs of all this crap you've admitted to, whether it's true or not, just trying to get out of an interview. Um, do they have something similar in your old cult? Um, so where they in my go above case, and so I think each case is different and I don't really know every case. Right, I know my course. experience, my experience. Yes. There was like some, so my dad um, threatened me with things and I feel like I, I have to build a backstory to all this, but um, basically um, to protect the person that essayed me, mm -hmm. they tried to spin it to where 
that I was the one essaying. Mm. And I don't know to who, I don't know the details, but I know that they were going to, the things that they told me was if I don't get, if I don't stop Chanel and Colleen from talking to like the news, which is ironic, they get on escaping polygamy later on. I was like, <laughs> I don't have no control over them. Like I even told that that was like my first response. I was like, I can promise not to go to the authorities, but I can't <laughs> promise they won't go to the authorities. But they basically, he, he told me that if I don't um, get basically promise that the three of us won't go to the authorities, then I will spend the rest of my life in jail is what he, he promised me. And I didn't know for what. Oh. And he's like, we, the thing that he told me was that we've put innocent people in jail and they were in jail for 22 years. Mm. So just think of that. What? Oh, they're in jail. Like what? Like regular jail or do they have their own? Just like, just regular jail. I don't understand how. And I, I just know wondered that, like, because you said earlier that, you know, you weren't supposed to go to authorities. So I thought maybe they created their own. I know. It's really kind of, I, I even thought of that in, the, in that moment. I was like, okay, so what about all this times that you're like, mm-hmm. we're not supposed to talk to the cops. But the second they want me out of the house, they're like, I'm going to call the cops. You're trespassing. <laughs> Get out. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's funny. Because we have Double the same standard. Policy. You can't go to authorities. And, um, that they're site controlled and the government controlled and the government site controlled and that it's all terrible and they're out to get everyone they're going to try to do us in but as soon as we needed them for something you know oh go ahead yeah yeah Yeah. that i was kind of shocked about and um i'm trying to remember so i don't really know the details like there might have been real crimes to this guy but he i know one previous member had to flee to mexico um Mm. when he left because Whoa. and he's still wanted like he's still wanted for all kinds of things that um are like ch- basically he's accused of like um having pictures of minors and different things mm. like that i don't know like the details mm. but i know he's in mexico and so i, I mean yeah. first of all being abused is horrible 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 thing to have happened to you but then you said that they made you take the blame for it but did they also blame you like that you it was your fault that it happened in the first place yeah Um, i really didn't understand like so i was so young that i didn't even understand what was happening and the mm -hmm. way it was presented to me was that um and i i I wish i knew how to say this in a cleaner way but i'm just gonna say it but like they're like, this is what you do when you get a boner. And then they're just like teaching me is what they were, the way it was explained to me. And then when I go to complain about it, because it was someone that was um, above me and finding, and I was finding fault with the one above, then I was told um, everything they did, they did for a reason. And you need to stop finding fault with the one above. And I just, so then at that point, you're just looking in, into like yourself like blaming and asking yourself and you're just kind of self-policing trying to figure Mm -hmm. out what it was that you did or didn't do or maybe it's maybe you're just misunderstanding the situation and it wasn't that bad um so yeah they take but i did have like later on i had a meeting with the leader brother paul about this incident because there was plenty of times where we went to him for um, guidance, I guess. And when I went to talk to him about this and asked him if I should like go to authorities, he he immediately told us that order members do not take other order members to authorities and that he would handle it. Mm. And so at that point, I was supposed to just like give it over to him let him deal with it and not worry about it. So like internal policing, it, it, never go to the outside. You don't want anything bad going to the outside. We'll handle it inside. Right. And yeah. the fact that that person never <clears throat> did that to me again means that brother Paul handled it. Mm. Oh, 
do they try to get new members? And it's a little off topic, but you made me think of it. Um, like to bring new people in, um, are they only trying to make them born in or do they also try to bring in new people just, you know, like you're out, you know, some person on the street or whatever. Like, do they try to well, make them members or convert? As far as new convert, or, like they don't really try to convert outsiders into mm -hmm. their cult. Majority of us are born into it. And this is something I want to talk about the bloodline that they teach so that they teach yeah. us that we are direct descendants of Jesus Christ, because mm -hmm. first of all, if Jesus Christ was perfect, this is their belief system, not mine. <laughs> then he would have had multiple wives because to get to the highest degree you have to have multiple wives mm. and if he had multiple wives he would have had kids and somehow magically the kingstons um who, which the kingstons a made-up name their real like name is bull so this is a bunch of bull but anyways <laughs> <laughs> but anyways so they um they just believe that their bloodline is direct descendants of Jesus Christ. And they got to the point to where they were breeding horses, cows, like different things. And they were like, to get this um, top of the line um, cattle or horse that's worth so much money, they, they started learning about some of that, how to breed that. And they started taking that into our group. So my dad mm -hmm. married four of his half sisters because they're going to be purebred and they're going to be and, and they that, out go ahead sorry go ahead so and they viewed any deformity as um well first of all a lot of the deformities they're just going to bury them it's not like mm. we, we just have home births so mm. and a girl has a child like every year so maybe this year didn't work out for you but next year you're still going to have another kid oh my so God. The um, what was it? The so any um deformity or any perfect child will m outweigh any deformity that we mm. get, and they'll be so worth it, basically. And in fact, to get the hold on of this of these issues, and um. Uh, to get a hold of these issues, they actually had people to go to school and get um, degrees in geneticists and in, in genetics. Wow. And so like my brother who actually died, his name was Aaron Larson. So I can say his name because he's dead, but <laughs> he, he actually Sorry. got a P PhD. Oh, I don't, I didn't know him. I have a lot of brothers. Oh, okay. Like 165 or some shit. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Wow. <laughs> so, so I don't really know him, so it's fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> he apparently got um like a degree in genetics and a PhD, and they would take our blood. They drew my blood, and so they would take our blood, and they would test it so they could figure out who could marry and who couldn't. And they they might be someone that thought they had direction, so they'll do some genetic testing to verify if your direction was going to work out because. Mm certain there's a certain gene that like there's a 25 percent chance that if these two people get married because they have both have this gene that they're gonna their baby is gonna be deformed mm. wow and they only know this because of after the fact like they've learned this from experience mm. and they do have their own lab now so they can like they can help you like my brother that was gay they offered him to they would inseminate his wife for him with his genetic material so that he didn't have to have sex with her after he came out as gay. Wow. But so obviously that's not they, a good idea. They didn't, um, they didn't <laughs> kick him out. I, I thought they were pretty they, evil to gay people. It's a choice. Yeah. Did, Russell, remember growing up having attraction to men? Yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> I forgot that part. And you had to choose. You had to choose to be with women, right? Yeah. Can't <laughs> That's what happened. It. So, so, but so are they just hoping that in the future he'll realize he made the wrong choice and then he'll come back to the light side or something? So they well, keep he's, him around, or they do have like things, ways of fixing that. Oh, and there's like conversion therapy and stuff. That kind of thing, yeah. Oh but, my um, gosh. 
I didn't stick around for that bullshit. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> How oh, did you man. get out? Like, what did you have to do to be like separated from there? No so, longer. Honestly, I think the biggest thing that helped me was I, once I started dating, um, it really didn't take long. You start talking to outsiders and you start realizing literally this, the guy that I dated, his grandma came and asked me about my life. And I was like, and she's telling me, this old lady's telling me, you know, that's not normal, right? Like none of this is real. Like you don't have to do any of the things that they tell you to do. <laughs> And I was like, I don't like <laughs> you. You can ask why, like, you could just not do it. <laughs> it's like, how old are you? Like, at this point, I'm like 22 years old. And this lady's telling me, oh. yeah, you don't have to ask permission for like your money. Like, this is not normal. And I was like, oh, OK. I just never talked to outsiders because if you like the way they explain outsiders to us. And honestly, I'm. I'm going to get some hate for this next comment, but okay. if you take, even if, even with me, if you take a random person off the street, okay, we're going to say off the street because that maybe won't make me look as bad. And you take a <laughs> random Mormon or a random order person and you put yeah. them together side by side, it's going to look like the order person has a better life because they have structure, really? because they have food, they have a place to live. They have you might get a homeless guy and they might be comparing us to like the worst of the worst. And in fact, that's all I even knew about was like, if you leave, you're going to be homeless. You're going to mm -hmm. do drugs. You're going to drink. You're going to all they all the outside people care about is sex. That's ironic. But um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause having 14 wives, you don't want sex. Right? <laughs> no, like, no, that's only for procreation. That oh, is, yeah. Like you only to have children <laughs> for the, Oh. for the man yeah <laughs> do, do you so. live on like a compound is that no okay no. so you, you can just so live the kingston's are mainstream they're honestly like viewed as like the mafia of polygamous groups mm. because they are in mainstream salt lake city they don't look any different from like a mormon person mm. so okay. they're it hard to find so like, are your neighbor, you're just in a regular neighborhood. Your neighbors are different. They're not in, in the order. Yeah. Regular neighborhood. Um, my neighbors, I was always next to Hispanics and we had a lot in common. We had a lot of kids. We had, I'm not trying to be like anything. We all like rice and beans. Like that's what we had. <laughs> like we all like the same thing. That was our punishment <laughs> meal. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh. You had punishment meal of rice and beans? Yes. It was all That's you could it. have. And it was made, it was, it was bad though. It was not made very well. No, no. seasonings. It's just like a bunch no. of mushy pinto beans and um, rice. A lot of times it was kind of a little gooey, kind of weird. Yeah, that was ours. That's the one thing that the Hispanics got right. They actually <laughs> made good rice and beans. <laughs> yeah. Flavorful. <laughs> Yeah, and ours was bland and not that yeah. good. <laughs> Plain old. Yeah, that was that's like so. And you try hard to get off of rice and beans because people be eating whatever else there was served, and ugh, you're eating rice and beans for like basically breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> so, so, oh my god! What you were both talking about before, it seems like ignorance is kind of a tactic of both of your groups. They take ignorance you out of school rice. early early i wouldn't call it well let's see uh, ignorance of the outside back. world sorry no 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 i'm just i just want to address mm. something there because like i do think ignorance is bliss right like but if you don't know like so all these people that are happy you can be happy because happy comes from within right mm -hmm. so especially when you're ignorant then you can be happy like but what the way it was taught to us was that you want to shelter, you want to keep the calf in the stall because you don't want it to like learn any bad things. Mm -hmm. Like it's for our own protection. We don't want to get corrupted. Um, that's the way it was exp explained to us. And so to, I don't know, you, that's why you cut off those people is when you cut off those people, you don't want to hear their poisonous words. Mm -hmm. It's like a witch casting a spell on you. Yeah. So, 
that's a huge similarity between the two groups because it's first of all the threat of losing everybody and then it's the once they're gone they have to be really gone you have to destroy them so that you can't get any outside influence it, like it sounds like influence from the outside world is really bad because they know that you're going to learn things and realize that this is a bunch of crap <laughs> it took one date one yeah. date <laughs> Sounds like an amazing date. <laughs> have, um, that that like, grandma was great. Your, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. Like, if you, I mean, obviously, you're allowed to get on a dating site. That's really strange. Like, not allowed. Not, I just did it. Oh, you're not. <laughs> you have like rules in there. Like, so for us, for example, like if you could not have like um, premarital. You could kiss somebody or hug them or whatever, but there's no like heavy petting, no like touchy feely, no sleeping with them until you're married. Did you guys have something like that? Yeah, we had ABC order standards. There's a letter for every bullshit rule. Um, <laughs> so let's see. So K was for kiss. Our first kiss is on our wedding day with our husband or wife, and we will wow. not hold hands with the opposite sex or anyone until we're engaged to be married to them. But yeah, that first kiss is supposed to be on your wedding day. Wow. So you get a Wow. Okay. Wow. So yeah, you don't know how to kiss. Actually, I think they do this. This is the other reason that they get the girls married so young is because they're so sheltered. They're so uh, protected within this corral, right? Or like within this culture. And they don't know anything different. Mm. And then they get married young okay so anywhere from 14 to 18 um if you're 18 years old and you're not married you're an old maid like something's wrong like you gotta you gotta get some sh shit right <laughs> but, Gosh. but um no so what am i trying to say i forgot but well you yeah, understand so, why they uh married oh the why they get so married young. so young yeah so the girls get married so young because okay so by the time you're 18 Imagine you've already been married for two years. You have two kids. You're mm -hmm. an 18-year-old girl. You've barely started learning about the bullshit. You're going to lo lose all of your family, all of this support even, because mm -hmm. it is a very kid-friendly place. Like, you can have a kid um, attached to you, uh, attached to your boob at work. Like, you can bring your kid right away. Uh, two mm -hmm. weeks out of having a child, you can take your child to work. But wow. so there's a lot of... There's a lot for a woman to like, by the time she grows up, she's already stuck. Mm -hmm. well, you, you, you talk a lot about, or you mentioned several times, like just being bad that people have wanted to unalive themselves, like just like it not being a good place. What is it that keeps them in? You know what I mean? Like what makes it so they feel like they can't go away? Like, or do they have a similar thing where for me, like I told you what we have to go through to get out, do you guys have something like that? Or how does well, that work when someone wants to leave? Kind of, people don't want to leave. I mean, you want to build up God's kingdom. If you want to leave, you're going to get beat in your place and learn you're like, you're not going to like, they use a lot of violence, a lot of discipline. Hmm. That's amazing. So you're conditioned from a young age um, to not question. You don't you don't question anything, especially okay. when it comes from the one above. So, yeah, I don't know. I can't really answer that question because I don't really know. I had one incident where I wanted to do that. I got out of silo. I was 14 and I was uh, at the farm and I thought about jumping. Mm hmm. But then I saw my mom looking for me and was like, well, maybe she, it would be kind of messed up if she found me. So maybe I won't jump. I'm glad you did. Yeah. But so they, I, I are they eating more or less to keep people in the order, like to make them not leave? Is that fear? They will have meetings. Yes. Oh my God. Will they have meetings? Meeting out your nine hour time meeting of like that you were talking about with the machine or whatever. Mm -hmm. We have like hour long meetings, uh, hours and hours. And these meetings are just like they just give you all kinds of metaphors and like different like scriptures. And it's just like, oh, my God, can we just be done? <laughs> <laughs> 
is it is but, it yeah. a meeting to try to keep you in if you're thinking about leaving or just meetings in general oh pretty yeah in general and if so basically whatever you're going through so yes if you're trying and thinking about leaving you're gonna have way more meetings way more meetings <laughs> That that right there is a disincentive to leave. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> I'm sick of talking about it. <laughs> yeah, so before you're 18, it's almost impossible to leave. If you try to leave, they actually have, um, they'll put you in. Oh my gosh, how do I say this? Because I'm not remembering. There was a lot. It's like a a rehab center for children. Okay, mm -hmm. but it's a public rehab center. They Lifeline. Um, is what it's called here in Salt Lake. And they don't do this now because they're kind of onto the polygamists using them as like to get their kids in order. But they'll mm. tell this um, rehab center that, oh, my daughter is addicted to sex and she's just like, she needs some rehabilitation. So she'll mm. be sent to this rehab center where there's the worst of the worst <laughs> kids, right? And these other kids are dealing with real issues and... So it's to manipulate them to be like, oh, yeah, um, I do want to go back to the order. Also, mm -hmm. their parents will come visit them and they'll be like, the second you're ready, to, we'll sign you out. Mm -hmm. But you have to stay here until you're ready to come back to the order. So they'll keep them. It, it, this is just below 18. So honestly, I kind of feel bad if you're trying to leave before you're 18. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Like you're not getting out. You just gotta make it to be an 18. And I hate saying it like that, but it's just that's it's really yeah. hard. And at that yeah. point, then it's just like if they want to stay, we're all adults, and it sucks that they only want to stay because they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. Right. But you kind of just have to respect their choice, and in anything else is just viewed as persecution to the group. So. Do you think that the um, like lack of education contributes to their staying? I know you mentioned in the other interview where they keep pulling you all out of school early. Like the absolutely, it only so like I said, it only took one conversation with a grandma to like know better, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but even then, like you know, if maybe you were lucky, you were you. You felt like already questioning. Yeah. And, and you could learn, you were able to learn quicker, but other people who are so into it for so long without questions, maybe they didn't learn and getting a job on your own, no support. That's really scary. Um, you right. Know, Je and Jenny you mentioned the same thing. You know, you have another language at, at, that people don't understand and you haven't learned maybe as much math or it's hard to go out and get a job. You've never paid for things because everything's kind of taken care of for you. It's like they right. do everything for you. So you don't learn so that you're stuck. Yeah. yeah everything I left, like the lowest level though. <laughs> Believe me, yeah. sitting in a dorm with nine other women is not fun. <laughs> yeah. I when I left, I didn't have any formal education. I had, I, I knew I was starting over when I left. Like mm -hmm. I had no education, no references because they're not going to be like, oh yeah, he was a great worker. <laughs> was that a, was that a struggle or did you just kind of like just push till you made it or? Well, like I think um, I, when I by the time I left, it was like there wasn't another option for me. Um, my mm. actually, I was kind of kicked out, so they kind of just took. So what happened with me was um, my dad showed up to to my work and gave me a motel key and told me in front of everyone that was there because i'm sleeping with men then i'm no longer a member and i'm no longer welcome in his house and here's a key to the motel all your stuff is in room 105 don't Whoa. worry about your mom and the kids they got a new brother that's gonna take your place and it's gonna take care of everything that you were taking care of Whoa. and i was just like <laughs> okay so yeah <laughs> i started over at that moment and, and wow. what did you do for money? So I fought with them. I, I told, I I fought with my father. I met with the leader brother, Paul. And I was like, I'm not leaving because he tells me to leave. Who says I slept with men? I didn't sleep with any men. <laughs> <laughs> but dude, and I, so, I don't know. <laughs> so were you able to keep working for a little while until you figure something else out? 
Yeah, actually, the other thing that was good about my job is that I was the, I was, it was me and one other person that was feeding 700 kids every day. So they needed so because, you. So because the leader needed me to feed all of his so many children, because he had like 40, 40, 42 wives and how many of the kids of his am I feeding? Who knows? So yeah. <laughs> 42 wives. I could be getting that wrong, but I think that's what and how many wives he has Holy maybe it's God. only 27 let's just say wow. 27 he has Still. at least 27 wives <laughs> it, either way i was thinking Jeez. he has at least 27 wives and i'm feeding wow. all of his kids and so they needed me and i was like i'm not leaving because he said that i'm leaving and then i used their logic and it's going to be really really hard to explain to you guys or to the viewers their language because they do have their own vocabulary but yeah. i actually was able because i was so ingrained into that my entire life i was able to use their logic against them mm. and be like well because of this my dad lost the keys but i'm instead of telling everyone that he lost the keys let me just tie to someone else because i'm trying to get to god and because i need to get to god and my dad has lost his way and then I need to tie to someone else. So I'm going to tie to my grandpa uh, mm. or, and, and then, so I worked it out with the leader to tie to either him or my grandpa. And then once I got that situated, because the men, I don't know, I did not explain in this interview about the money, but the money, all the money basically goes to a family account that the dad is in charge of. Okay. Mm. So my money was still in the family account. Oh. And so I was like, but I'm no longer part of his family and I don't tie to him. So we need to get that money out of that account oh. and put it in my grandpa's family's account. But my grandpa's a nice guy. So I got my money. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. So you did. Oh, that's what, That was are, my. They were still not thinking they were giving you your money back. They were thinking it was going to someone else. But because he's a decent person, he gave it back to you. What? Right. That was my next question. Did you have anyone inside that? helped you when you were transitioning out and i guess maybe your grandpa for one was there anybody else yes there was one other person and i'm afraid to like they're still in the order and i'm yeah kind of then you don't have to say to their learn. name but yeah, yeah they did help me they set up the meetings with paul they wrote letters because i was actually like completely illiterate at the time and couldn't wow. and i'm not the best reader i'm dyslexic but i like couldn't write I had no writing ability at all. And so wow. this lady, she was able to, to type up some, something, some message to Paul and she really helped me with all those meetings. And I was sleeping. Um, I didn't stay in the motel more than one night. So what happened was I ended up sleeping in my car. And so, yeah, so that lady helped me so that I could at least have a living, a couch to sleep on before I like made the move to leave. And then I kind of slept in a car a little bit again. Then I went to a, an uncle who had left the group 15 years prior. Okay. Okay. Cause, Cause he actually saw my message on Facebook. So I put a, I didn't know what to do. I was just like sleeping in my trunk and I'm like, this is kind of sad. I don't know what to do. Yeah. And so I just like leave a post. I'm like, I think I need help. Like, I don't really know what to do. So. <laughs> But he's, he just messed, I guess he called me. He had heard from my mom what was going on. And he said that I had a place at his house for as long as I needed it. Wow. So I stayed there for like six months and went to Job Corps, got an, a GED, a trade. Job Corps is a government fun, uh, program mm -hmm. that teaches you a trade and then gives you like a, a your high school. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah, I just kind of started over. Wow. That's, I mean, I know starting over, it's hard. <laughs> and if you don't have somebody who can kind of be like a lifeline, it's, it's even harder. I mean, especially like, you know, you grow up in that setting and everything's about that. And then when you enter the real world, I always call it the real world. When you enter that, a lot of stuff doesn't actually translate so yeah and people don't understand you because you don't make sense yeah no i had i was in a conversation with this one one guy when i was living in texas and i used and you know i knew that some of the words 
we're normal English words, obviously. And so I'm talking and I use this word and he looks at me and he goes, what did you say? And I said it again. He goes, I said a real word. He goes, I think that you um, basically have like the wrong definition for that word. I was like, no, because I'm sure in my mind, this is one of the normal words. Of course, it was a normal word that was given a new definition in Scientology. So I didn't. So I, I just felt like a dummy. He was being super nice. He goes, yeah, he goes, look it up. And so I got my little, you know, because I had a cell phone. I, you know, dictionary.com. I looked and I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, how many other words are not I just, are I just not the same? Oh, I was just very careful with what I said. And I just try to use all the easiest words I could think of because I knew those ones were straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I first left, um, I actually got with there's a there's an organization here in Utah that helps people that are transitioning from the polygamous group to the real world. Mm -hmm. And that kind of was a like an open my eyes for that whole like vocabulary difference. But not most not because this is how it basically made sense to me. So because I was going to their organization, I got to meet a lot of FLDS. And the FLDS made no sense to me. Like when they would speak, I was like, is that a word? Like, and then I was like, is that what I sound like when I tell my story? And I, and I was just like, I got to figure out how to explain this in a way that makes any kind of sense to another human being. Yeah. A lot of times I would sit there with my dictionary.com, had it just like as a permanent tab. And if I was going to say something or talk about something, I would quickly punch in the word and just make sure I actually had a normal English definition before saying it. But yeah, little, I mean, a little off topic, but did you have, have you ever seen Unbreakable Kimmy Smith on Netflix? No, but someone keeps telling me I should watch that show. Is it on still? Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's still there. It's I love it. It it kind of I it came out later after I left, but like the crazy thing about that show and i know we're so far off topic right now all right. But, that's all right <laughs> but basically she was in a bunker for like 14 15 years something like that and then she gets out into the real world and she has a lot of weird things like she's afraid of veil velcro <laughs> and what i've done everything that's normal like she just and that was me like i was just like i'm just normal i, I didn't even want it like i was like nope that never happened and then it would be really hard to have a conversation with someone because they start asking about your family and like um, I don't have a family. I don't know what heritage I am. I think I'm white. I just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I checked. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's I just cool. um, I just tried my hardest to fit, like to be invisible. I never wanted to like um, like in the group you wanted to be invisible because if you were being seen, that means you're in trouble. Yes. So, I was already conditioned to just be like, nobody look over here. Even when I sneeze and someone say, God bless you. I was like, oh crap, they noticed. <laughs> like, like, I just wanted to be like, I don't want to be a burden to anyone. I just want to be invisible. And yeah. I want to handle my own shit. So I think finally coming out, like doing the interviews with Shalice and like, it's been years, but I'm kind of coming to the, part now in my life where I'm like, I can't just pretend that didn't happen. Like I need to own it. Like in life we're have, we have, we all have one person that we're responsible for. And you have this child that you're responsible for. Right. And if you could do, you want the best for that child. If he was the one to be in charge of that. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that I'm that child. Like, so I have to like go back to everything understand and like because this life is my responsibility it might right. not be my fault mm -hmm. but this is my responsibility to get this shit together mm -hmm. so i'm owning it now and it's it's great but i love that show i would definitely recommend it to anyone that is from a cult like because there's just so much that's relatable mm. I'm, I'm definitely going to check it out because someone else <laughs> mentioned it too that it's yeah, that exact same thing. It's kind of like you come out of this kind of bubble and, you know, it's, you know, trying to deal with all that. So I think that'd be interesting. I did have that another question. Season. 
Huh? Sorry, sorry, still on that note. That first season is great. The second one is like they're trying too hard. Go ahead. <laughs> so I'll watch season one. I, I do. I, I tend to, if seasons go on and on and on, I tend to kind of get disinterested. Too much of the same thing over and over. Yeah. Um, and my attention sometimes can get limited. <laughs> but you had a question. Yeah, I was wondering, so... Obviously, um, they, you know, the way your um, the order is, is you, you have the women, you have each man has multiple wives, they have tons of babies, blah, 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 blah. What, like, you said they don't agree with people being gay and that it's like a quote unquote choice, but like, what is their perspective of it? Do they see it as being like an illness or do they see it as being aberrative or do they see it as being, like, like you're a terrible person because you feel that way or like, what is, how do they feel about somebody who is, you know, who is gay or of that? So I've never really, so this is, this is how they view it, at least the way I understood it. So the way I understood it is being gay is a trial and God wouldn't give you any trials or tribulations that you can't handle. Oh. And so, so if you were one of those people with that special, like this is like, it's almost a special task that you have to um, overcome because God knows you can do it. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Uh, this, and this is a they general. Or they just think that you need to get through it. Yeah. Like. It's probably like a phase. Like as soon as you get married, it'll go away. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, interesting. And this is a general like religion question. So you have this all powerful being, you know, in the universe and he or it thinks it's so important to give you this little person on this planet, the all these trials and he does it to everyone in the world. Like why do they think God cares is that narcissistic so i'm just kidding it, it, it's yeah yeah I, I don't know uh, that's my question like where is it that you're so important as part of this group that he gives you trials to make you the best you can be like it just sounds so crazy to me that this all-powerful feeling he can't stop tornadoes or hurricanes but he can put these thoughts in your head and and make challenges for you to overcome but Russell, you're forgetting he's also perfect. Oh, okay. Perfect and <laughs> all and knowing can, and <laughs> but, but so and then is are the natural disasters are those just other challenges for people to overcome? Who are you to question God? Oh yeah. That's 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 the usual <laughs> yes, that No, kind of, seriously, that's that yes. kind of answer all the time. I'm like, and not Sweet. growing up in it, I have the advantage of seeing other opinions, right? So right, like what's wrong with asking questions? What why right. are we getting all these like ultimate defense answers where they can't yeah. give us a real answer? Yeah. Whereas yeah. like a scientist will say we don't try to ask. Yeah, a scientist will say we don't know, we're trying to figure it out and here's our theories, but they're like this is it. You're in trouble cuz you asked a question. Don't ever ask a question. How dare you breathe? Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just seems so harsh and so ridiculous it, it, it uh, is it's it's like i grew up in narnia when i, when I left the <laughs> closet i was just like yeah that was fake <laughs> that's a good analogy <laughs> narnia. wow oh my goodness you know what i would think would be fun for like maybe i don't know if you would be interested in this val but like just even in the future, if we take specific topics and we look at that from like a three-way perspective, like, you know, your like both of yours and mine, like, but like specifically take up, let's talk about ethics and justice. Let's talk about, you know, spirituality. Let's talk about control. Let's talk about brainwashing. Let's, you know, like break up these things where, cause they could, there's so much that you could really dive into I don't know. It's funny because like you talk about you had um, a couple of different codes 
we had a couple too that, you know, we, ha- we would have to chant or, you know, they call it Chinese school or whatever, where they say, you say it back until you like learn it verbatim basically. And yeah, uh, ours were called the memory, the memory gems. And we said those twice a day, every day. Wow. Really? How many yeah. were there? I don't remember. I could go off and give you a whole minute spill of them. Though. The main <laughs> one that is like true happiness is not found in doing what you want to do, but in learning to like to do the things you ought to do. Uh. Yeah. Like we had a code for the Sea Org and you have to like swear. They make you swear to every year. You have to do it when you go in, but then every year you have to sort of renew this vow, these whatever it was called the code of a Sea Org member. And it was 18 points, but it was kind of like, uh, a promise to help get ethics in on this planet and the universe, which is some, some, I don't remember the rest, but one of them was like, I, I, I totally forgot about this, but I was thinking about it randomly. Cause you were talking about, yeah, your gems things or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, God, I'm through But one of ours was, it, it went as far as saying that, um, that you promised to help, like diminish any enemy like you you, you have to oh like um, you're gonna take them down yeah <laughs> you're gonna take them down like if you're <laughs> told to does that mean like you go like so oh. like if someone's attacking our organization we you have whatever to, you can and not just stand by it but if they say if they call on you to attack back you salute both right. like let's do it <laughs> <laughs> One oh my up. gosh it's you can look at I don't know at least it sounds a lot <laughs> your your guys's organization it's very different but I feel like that maybe we stole some of this stuff you know at least foundational type stuff but well, like actually you crazy situations and then like you stick with it you don't just leave like the like the time the number of times I went through something so insane and I look back now I go why didn't I just walk then. Why didn't I just walk out the door then? You know, and, 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 like I ask these things, but it, that's part of what I've just sort of been looking at and why I want to also talk to other people who are in similar situations. It's like, what are those things that are holding us, that held us there, you know, that made it so we couldn't just get ourselves to do it? Self-policing, like you said, was one is a big thing. It's not big. I mean, you even police family. yourself on the internet and look at bad mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. Like ever. Well, with ours, everything we go to, even the grocery store is in the gro- in the cult. Mm. So everything, our entire lives is like the, like if you leave, you're losing not just, you're losing all your best friends because my best friends were my five brothers, my same age. Mm. And you're losing your mom, all, everything you ever know. You'll lose your job immediately. You have no job. Mm-hmm. You don't have like proof of education. I mean, they're they're coming a long way, but this is just my experience. Like, because now they have like, like I said, my one brother, he got a degree in genetics. But you kind of have to get approved to do that. It has to be your mm-hmm. calling. And the one above has to decide that's what you're going to do for the order's growth. Mm. I'm sure if but, you had any past mistakes, they wouldn't push you forward on that, you know, track to yeah. go get an education. Oh, yeah. Also, so you say you do that every year on the um, the you kind of re like really uh, what's the word like where you renew sort your of vows. Uh, huh? renew it's your like vows. renewing your vows yeah it's yeah exactly you sort of recommitting yourself to these to we had these, a similar so. thing did you have to sign something for that uh, we had to sign um, yeah so you sign it yes uh, initially when you first do it. When you renew it, you don't have to sign it. But every time you do like a service, like a, they call it a service. So every time you do one of their courses or something like that, you have to sign all these documentations saying that like you're there on your own. You're, you know, trying to find out for yourself. You're never going to use it against them. You'll never speak out against them. You'll, you know, like yeah. you're just going to be a good little, you know, slave or whatever. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. You call it. I mean, so, that's not a really a different word for it. But we had a similar thing where every year we actually would sign a 10%. They call it a 10% form and an inventory form. But basically the inventory form is you're signing that everything you own belongs to the church. Oh wow! And you sign that every year. 
Wow. We we didn't do that, but we didn't have much to speak of. So <laughs> like yeah. We had some clothes and you know, you get some, you know, like if family give you gifts, like my grandma used to give me jewelry all the time. So I had a whole jewelry box full of things from her. Um, but yeah, when I left it was like everything fit in like a trunk. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's the closest thing we had to relate to your renewing of vows or whatever was the every mm -hmm. year we just had to sign those forms. What was and if you 10%? don't sign the form, the 10% is that they would take that like at the end of the year, you, you would need to sign that 10% form so they could take 10% of everything you saved and that would go to the church. And like then you tithing have, or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And so yeah, that's the closest thing we had that's hmm. like that. It's so interesting. <laughs> I said we don't have to take your whole day, but it's been super interesting and really yeah. appreciate you talking to us. It's really interesting how similar both of your religions are in certain ways. And it'd be really cool to kind of dial down on certain topics um, where they are similar or different are, it, yeah. either way.